down in number today. There, there's several people that didn't come. They didn't know we had a roof on the building, and it rained. And so we'll let them know. Next time they're back, we'll let them know. We do have shingles. And they won't get wet in the church house. Hebrews chapter number 2. We welcome our online crowd watching on internet. We have a report once every month or so about how many states tuned in to see our live stream services. And we not only have most of the states uh, represented, but we see our service has been watched in multiple countries, which seems really weird. You know, we're just a little church here, <laughs> here in the hills of Arkansas, and we've got people watching us from the other side of the world. And, and I guess that's because they didn't have any preacher around there to hear, and so they got to find one somewhere. <laughs> but uh, I count it a great honor to get to, uh, to have even a, a larger audience hearing the gospel than what we have in the four walls here. And so we appreciate all of them. Sometimes people are sick and not able to attend, and I was that way myself a while back, and I got to watch the services online, and so I'm glad we have it. It doesn't take the place of a real in-person service, and so we encourage those uh, who watch online, we encourage you to watch when you can't come, but we sure would love it if you'd come and sit with us so we can fellowship with you and see you in person. Hebrews chapter number 2, we finished our Ecclesiastes uh, series of messages on the meaning of life last week, and so I, I, I'm mostly an expository preacher. I like to take a passage of scripture, maybe a series of passages, and preach through that passage, pulling out the teaching from that very passage and going verse by verse a lot of times. And today I'm just I'm, I'm planning on bringing a topical message because I believe it's timely and one that will be helpful to us. Hebrews chapter number 2, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. Hebrews 2 verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. Let's pray and I want to preach about the danger of drifting this morning. The danger of drifting. In verse number 2 or verse number 1, the second part, He says, Lest at any time we should let them slip. For those who have heard and have a grip for a while and then let them slip, there is that danger of drifting as a boat or a ship whose anchor has been lifted and it's free to drift and possibly end up on the rocks or in a crash. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us today as we come to this important topic, Lord, of the danger of drift, drifting and, Lord, how it can happen to any of us. And Lord, we pray that the sweet Holy Spirit would come and take these truths and make them dear to our hearts this morning. May we leave this place being closer to you. Lord, loving you more even than when we came. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's been a long time ago. I think I was a young teenager. A cousin of mine and some of his friends went spelunking. They were avid cave explorers, and they found a new cave that nobody had, to their knowledge, nobody had explored yet, and so they were big into this, and they had all the equipment, and so they, uh, they went to this cave, which was in a remote area, and they had, uh, they had done this before, so it was not new to them. They knew that they needed to carry a bunch of ropes with them and lights and stuff like that in case in case they get way back in there and need extra light to get back out or if they need extra rope to uh, descend some cliffs or crevices. And so they, they knew what they were, were doing, but when they got 
way back in there, they, got, they had to descend several cliffs and wade several streams. And when they got way back in there, they, they looked around and saw the beauties of the cave. And, and they decided it was time to go home. And so they started out. And they came to that first cliff that was like, I don't know, it's probably 30 to 50 feet high. And they came to that cliff and started to climb back out. And although they had plenty of rope, the muddy conditions in that cave, the mud had got on the ropes. And when they tried to climb up, they'd get up a little ways and that mud would let them slip and they'd fall back to the ground again. They tried and tried until they wore themselves out and they said, we don't know what we're going to do. We're just going to have to wait. Maybe somebody will find us. Maybe these ropes will dry up enough that we can climb out. Fortunately for them, they had left word with somebody where they would be and so the rescuers were able to find the cave and go in and extricate them out of the cave because they had professional equipment to get them out. They couldn't get out of the place they'd gotten themselves into because the ropes would slip. You and I who are Christians, we can be very familiar with the things of God, with the faith, with the Savior. And because we get in ourselves in some muddy conditions in life, we can let things slip. And so the, the context of our verses here that we read is in the, kind of in the context of a, a ship in harbor, the haven of rest, uh, out on the wild seas, the wild blue seas. They can just go anywhere in any direction. If you don't have a rudder and a sail or a motor, then you're just at the mercy of the sea. But if you've got an anchor, you get into the haven of rest, you can drop the anchor and you're safe. Well, the original readers of the book of Hebrews it hadn't been long since Jesus had died on the cross, had been resurrected from the dead, and uh, a church had been established there in Jerusalem. And, and now some of those Hebrew people, they were Jews, and they had grown up under Judaism, and they believed that, that the way to contact God and to please God and to worship God and to, to be saved would be to connect with God through the temple. And so they would go to the temple and sacrifice animals and and uh, they had their priesthood that worked in the temple and their method of worship. And so they grew up under all that. Everything in Jewish life centered around that temple. Now some of these people that he's writing to, the author of Hebrews, is writing to them because they've come a ways. They had a grip on the faith. They knew about Jesus. They'd heard the word preached. Perhaps they'd read some of the written word of God. But now they've come to the place where there's some families who are willing to disown their kids who are trusting in Christ because they thought the Jews ought to be only involved in temple worship and they believed that Jesus was an imposter. And so now they're faced with a dilemma. Do they go back to the temple or do they continue on with Christ? Salvation is in Christ and the faith is that He is the only way. The old temple worship is now... It's a shadow of the past. It was true in the Old Testament, but now it's a shadow of the past. And Jesus is now the substance of those shadows. And you can't go back to the things of the past in the Old Testament. And so the writer of Hebrews is writing them to not lose their focus on Jesus, not lose their focus on the faith, the faith being that body of truth that is connected to Jesus and His Word. The Bible says that Jesus and His Word are one and the same. They're inseparable. If you see, if you see the Jesus of the Bible, you're seeing Jesus as He is represented in the Word. And a lot of people say, well, I've got my own ideas about Jesus. Well, you may have, but He is the Word. In John, the Gospel, He's called the Word, the Word of God. So these people in Hebrews are beginning to drift. And the author of Hebrews, which may have been Paul, I kind of think it was, we don't know for sure, but the author of Hebrews is writing these Hebrew people who trusted Christ, been involved in church, and now they're saying, well, if we don't go back to the temple, our families are going to disown us. If we don't go back to the temple we may lose our job because our employer is still a Jew and he still believes in temple worship. And if we don't go back to the temple, then some of our friends are going to withdraw from us. And so there were a lot of negatives that were invading their mind and, and they were tempted to go back to the temple worship and release their grip, their focus, 
on Jesus Christ and the faith. Well, they begin to drift, and that's what the author is trying to keep them from doing. I want you to see first, if we're going to think about this subject of drifting today, and it applies to you and me, not just those Hebrew believers back there, although we may not be tempted to go back to temple worship because we weren't, we weren't Jews. I doubt if there's any Jews in here this morning. And uh, even if you were, you can't go back to the temple worship. Jesus is the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so there's only one way to heaven. There's only one way to the Father. There's only one way to live the life that's pleasing to God, and that's through Christ. And so, first of all, I want you to see the reality of drifting. Can this drifting actually happen? I mean, a Christian is just a Christian, isn't he? I mean, if you've been saved, you're saved. And so, uh, if you can't lose your salvation, then why, why worry about it? Well, drifting is a reality, and let's see about it. It's a heartbreak when we see maybe family members or fellow church members or someone we were friends with. and We see that they were on fire for the Lord at one time, but that fire has begun to flicker and die down, and they're in danger of drifting. They're not as close. They're not as close as they used to be, and they're drifting away from God. That concerns you, and your heart breaks. If we let our focus on the Lord and our grip on the faith slip, we begin to drift. To show that the scriptural examples of it happening, that it can happen to you and me, they're plentiful in the Bible. Do you remember Lot and Abraham? Lot was Abraham's nephew. They came out of Ur of the Chaldees. Abraham became rich. He had lots of herds, and they were in agriculture and, uh, and cattle. And Abraham got rich, and Lot was building up his herds, and they're dwelling together. But then Lot uh, began to, uh, his herdsmen began to fuss with Abraham's herdsmen. And uh, finally, uh, Abraham said to Lot, you know, the, the land may not be big enough for both of our herds and, and our families and all, so you, you choose where you want to go. If you go over there, then I'll go over here. And if you go over here, then I'll go over there. And, and so they parted ways. Lot began. He'd, he'd grown up under Abraham, Father Abraham, the father of the Jews. He'd grown up under this man who had trained him and now he's beginning to get his eyes off of the land of promise and his eyes back over this way on the plains of Jordan. They were green. He said, man, that would be a good place for my cattle. And it wasn't long. He just drifted a little further and a little further. Finally, it says he pitched his tent towards Sodom. He drifted a little further, and then finally he moved into Sodom and lived right in the middle of the place that God was going to destroy for their great sins. And so, can drifting happen? You bet, it did. It happened a lot. What about King David? King David was a man after God's own heart. And yet, the Bible says that even though he was after God's heart and God loved him and he loved God, there came a time when he began to drift. In, uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse number 1, King David's had some great successes, and that's when you've got to watch, ladies and gentlemen. When you've had great successes, there can come great temptations and the possibility of drifting. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse number 1, King David has been a great general over the armies, and now he's king, and he's won a lot of battles. But now it says in chapter 11, verse number 1, and it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbi. So... David was a great warrior, but now he's, he's hanging out at home. He's hanging around the palace. He sends Joab and his men to go fight the enemy, and he stays home. It says in the last part of that verse, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. David tarried still at Jerusalem. You know, when David began to drift, it's because he was just hanging around. That's why parents, we ought not to let our kids just go out somewhere and hang around. There needs to be an aim. There needs to be a purpose. David lost interest in working for the Lord as he had done in the past. And what happens next as he's hanging out in Jerusalem, then he looks down and sees a woman by the name of Bathsheba bathing on a housetop. And he begins to 
gaze and look and then he began to lust. See, the drift keeps coming and he's drifting further and further and finally he brings one of his servants in and says, go get that woman and bring her up here. You see, once you start to drift, the speed picks up and you drift faster and faster and pretty soon you're in the throes of sin before you even realize it. Solomon had early training. He knew the ways of the Lord. He wrote the Proverbs, most of them. He wrote the Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. Solomon knew the Lord early in life, but then he began to drift. He got bored with things, and he wanted to try out new things, and, and he gave his life to wine, women, and song. And pretty soon that becomes an obsession with him. He married oodles of wives, idolatrous wives. And the drift began to take him further and further away because when you marry the wrong one that doesn't get you closer to the Lord, she's probably going to take you further away from the Lord, him or her. And that's what happened to Solomon. Those idolatrous wives caused him to drift and drift and drift. Ladies and gentlemen, it can happen to us. Peter, in the New Testament, who had followed Jesus so closely, he was one of the 12, man. He followed Jesus. And even the night before Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus said, now this night, uh, you're all going to forsake me. Peter stands up boldly and says, well, those guys might, Lord, but not me. I'm sticking with you through thick or thin. I'm ready to die with you if I have to. Oh, it's easy to make big, bold boasts, isn't it? Talk about how spiritual we are, how strong we are in the flesh. That night when Jesus was going to trial or prior to his crucifixion, Peter decided this is getting a little too hot for him. In Luke twenty-two fifty-five, 55, it says, And when they had kindled a fire, and Jesus there being questioned and tried by a kangaroo court, and Peter's following far off, far off, and he says, And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them, among the secular people, the unbelievers. Peter sat down among them. Do you ever notice when people start to drift away from the Lord, they begin to hang out with other people? They used to be your friend when they were living for the Lord like you are. They used to hang out with you. They used to be in your fellowship, and they used to be uh, doing things, activities with you. But now they've got a different crowd they're hanging out with. And it says, And Peter sat down among them, but a certain maid uh, beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him, with Jesus. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. Oh, wait, isn't this the same Peter that just said earlier? I won't, I'll go to death with you. But now here he is saying, I don't know the guy. <laughs> and after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also one of them. Peter said, Man, I'm not. And about the space of one hour after another, confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. Because Pete, Jesus had told Peter, he said, before the, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. And there it happened. Drift, drift, drift. And Peter remembered when he heard the rooster crow. Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he'd said unto him before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And if you read the whole account of this trial where Peter is there by the devil's fire warming himself, you'll find that the eyes of Jesus fell upon Peter way off over there to the side. Peter doesn't know that Jesus can even see him because of all the hullabaloo that's going on, Jesus, Jesus saw Peter when he denied him and fulfilled his prophecy that you'd deny me three times where the rooster crows, the eyes of Jesus fell upon Peter. I don't think it was mean-spirited eyes. I don't think it was a hateful look. I think it was a look of pity. Like, Peter, I told you, you should have listened. I'm so sorry that you've come to this place. Instead of caring for his own crucifixion, he's concerned about Peter and when you drift away from the Lord and you deny the Lord and you begin to serve him less and you begin to make him less important and the faith is just something you can take it or leave it then his eyes are upon you the Bible says his eyes are on us all the time and he looks upon us with eyes of pity and grace and compassion 
He said, I wish you hadn't done that. I wish you'd come back. Well, the Bible says that the devil walketh about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And you know, a lion, when he stalks the prey, he doesn't go around growling before he catches the prey. That would scare the prey away. The devil, as a roaring lion, pounces upon his prey stealthily, quietly, swiftly. And then he roars. And that's what the devil does to people like Peter and people like Lot and Solomon and King David. He allows them to veer off to the side, to drift a little out of the haven of rest, and then he pounces on them. And then the devil roars, he growls, and he mocks, and he laughs, and he says, See there, you thought you were such a big Christian. You're nothing. And he laughs at you. That's what the devil loves to do. Now we've talked about the reality of drifting. I think we could just go on and on with biblical examples where people who were considered great men of God drifted away from the Lord. So that's a fact. Number two, the reason for drifting. How does this happen anyway? Why does it happen? Back to our verse in Hebrews 2.1, he says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed, underline those two words, earnest heed, to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Earnest heed. So earnest heed is what causes us to pay attention. Earnest heed is what makes us serious about the faith and about following Jesus. Earnest heed is what makes us remember the word that we've read and heard preached and taught. Earnest heed is what weighs on our mind and says to us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then all these things shall be added unto you. When we neglect the faith, it fades and falters. But why? Well, not giving... Well, there's a lot of different reasons. There's one main reason that the others can fall under. We didn't give earnest heed. We thought, I can, I, can, I can play with fire and not get burned. In the Proverbs it says, Can a man take fire unto his bosom and be not burned? Well, we know better than that. But we forget because we didn't pay earnest heed. We didn't take the things of God seriously. It didn't take us long that we decided, well, if I miss church once in a while, it's not a big deal. If I just don't pray every day, that's not a big deal. If I don't read my Bible all the time, that's not a big deal. If I don't share my faith with others, that's not a big deal. If I just don't do it every week, but we begin to drift. And the thing about drifting is, when you begin to drift, it goes faster and faster and faster. These Hebrews were neglecting the word of exhortation. In the same book, Hebrews, he said, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. And so much more as you see the day approaching. There's a day coming when the Lord's coming back. And if... If there's ever a time when we ought to be more faithful to the faith, more faithful to the church, more faithful to our Christian ways, more faithful to the Lord Jesus, it ought to be now. The time's drawing near. The dawn is setting upon this earth. These Hebrews had been warned, but evidently they hadn't really paid a lot of attention to the warning because some of them were drifting badly. Brother Denny worked in the hospital in... Uh, nuclear medicine and doing MRIs part of the time he did some other things too but in the hospital they had warning signs up you know in his profession he's doing he's working with radiation and x-rays and stuff all the time and you can't be exposed to that solid every day day after day after day hour after hour after hour without radiation taking its toll and brother Denny he did those warning signs and he stood back behind the glass that he could look through as a coward. 
Not a coward, he's wise because he didn't want to be exposed. See, the patience is getting one dose, but then he's there every day, all day long, doing the same thing over and over, and the radiation would catch up to him. A patient can go in one time or two times or a few times and be x-rayed and not be detrimental. But the workers there have to take precautions. These Hebrews didn't take precautions. They had, they had seen the warnings. They had heard the preaching. They had seen the miracles and the wonders and the things that God had done in their midst. Now they're drifting because they didn't heed the warnings. man told me that he had gotten saved as a very young man. And he just got so busy just talking to him. He said he's just so busy. He just didn't have time for church. He didn't have time for the Lord. He just didn't, didn't have time for the things of God. I went to his house once and, and tried to talk to him about the things of the Lord. And, and he was pretty cold. I mean, he didn't hit me, but I thought, he's not liking this. <laughs> I mean, it was cold enough that I could tell he didn't want me coming back and talking to him again. <laughs> well... Things happened, time passed. He stayed covered up. And this was year, years ago when he got saved. But he told me recently that his grandkids got saved at a Baptist church. and They were going to be baptized. And they were saying to their granddad, come and, come and see us get baptized. He said, ah, man, I, I ain't got time for that. I've got... I'm involved in an industry that requires my time seven days a week. I'm just too busy. I can't go. And the time is getting closer and getting closer for them to be baptized. And they stayed on their granddad. And then his own kids, their parents, started saying, you better go see him get baptized. And Boy, they were all on his, riding his hump. <laughs> you better go. He said, all right, I'll find a way. And so he laid some things aside and rescheduled re some things. And he went to the service. And... They heard the preaching of the word of God, him and his wife. And they said, you know, we got some help out of that. Let's go back again. And they went back to church again. And they got more help. And they kept going back. And he said he rededicated his life to the Lord that he had drifted so far from. He had left the faith in practical ways. I'm not saying he lost his salvation. I'm saying he just left the practice of the faith in view of his job, his work, it demanded so much of him. He just didn't have time for the Lord. Now, there's more to that story I'll give you in a little bit. Another Christian man that I knew and know very well lives in another place. Got saved. And boy, he got on fire for God. He's just doing some stuff for the Lord. Boy, just doing more than he ever did. He never had time for it before, but he made time to serve God. Man, he's on fire, helped build, uh, helped build some churches and establish some churches. Just got really busy for the Lord, and he's going great guns at it, and he loves what he's doing. He loved talking about the Lord. He loved talking about prophecy. He loved talking about the Bible. He just Everything to him was about the Lord. And then in the last church he was in, he was a little too busy, I guess, and he was helping a little too much for some people. And they began to criticize him. And they got into some squabbles and some arguments. And he got offended. And so he just left. That's been a few years ago. He's drifted a long ways. He didn't mean for it to happen that way. He didn't plan it. He didn't say, I'm just going to backslide. But he got offended and kind of visited around a little bit, a few churches, and finally decided, well, I can't get along with people of the Christian faith anyway, so he just quit. Now he doesn't share his faith in how to get saved. Now he doesn't serve in any church. Now when we talk, very seldom does the subject ever get raised by him about the Lord or things of the faith. He's not setting the example for his kids and grandkids now. He's drifted so far. 
Now it just doesn't matter. He didn't mean for it to be that way. He didn't plan on saying, I'm just going to quit. But he started to drift little by little, a little further, a little further, until things grew dim about the faith. And now he finds himself in a place, I say he finds himself, I don't know if he finds himself or not, but others notice. He's not doing anything for the Lord anymore. What happened? Now he's just involved in the secular world, doing things to make a living, his work. There's various reasons why people let their grip fade on the faith. But it generally boils down to one thing. They just didn't give earnest heed. I mean, if, it's, if, if the writer of Hebrews is saying, guys, it's more important to keep a grip on the faith, to think about the things of God and to be immersed in the things of God more than the things of the world. If you're not doing that, you're going to drift. And he's warning them of that. So what is the result of this drifting? Number three, the result of drifting. What happens? I mean, is there a cost? Can a guy just drift away from the Lord? Can a lady just drift away from the Lord? And So what? doesn't matter. Well, you, you'll lose joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's what the Bible says. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You lose your joy. When David sinned with Bathsheba in, in, uh, in the book of Psalms, you'll hear him confessing to God his sin and how he wanted God to restore unto him the joy of thy salvation. Had he lost his salvation? No, but he lost the joy of it. And so can we. You can lose your joy, lose your purpose. Like a ship without a rudder, drifting aimlessly in the wide open seas. You can lose precious souls. You see, there are souls out there that need to be saved, and it does matter how I live. It does matter how you live, and it does matter if we have our attention upon the Lord, and it does matter if we're fervent about the things of the Lord because that rubs off on other people, and they begin to say, hey, if it's important to them, maybe I better check this out. There may be souls that will never be exhorted to come to the Lord because you didn't think it was important if you're drifting. You can lose effective service. You can be set on the shelf of mediocrity. Paul, the greatest missionary of all time who wrote most of the New Testament or nearly, all, nearly most of the New Testament. I think if you take, it depends on how you divide it up. If you're dividing it up by books, he wrote most of it. The Apostle Paul was the greatest missionary ever. Inspired to write the word of God. Established churches all over the place. Led people to Christ constantly. And yet he said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He's not talking about losing salvation. He's talking about cast away, cast aside, set on a shelf. So those who were once used of God to do some great things for the Lord in some area of their giftedness, but now they're set on a shelf. I've got an old chicken house. Uh, it's one of the long broiler houses. It's uh, 150 feet long. And when we moved there 25 years ago, that thing had a bunch of junk in it, just household stuff. You know, I mean, talking about vases, furniture, mattresses, uh, toys, tools, just stuff. And then we moved in. I added my stuff to it. <laughs> and so you can go out in that old chicken house, and, man, it looks like there's a lot of stuff. I told Aaron a while back, I said, son, look in here. One of these days, all of this will be yours. <laughs> Well, we're burning a bunch of it now and trying to clean some of it out to make more room to park a tractor or car or something like that in there and trailers and stuff. But that stuff just wasn't usable anymore and it got set aside in that old chicken house. Been sitting there for 25 years or longer. You know, I wouldn't want to be used of God up to a certain point and then make myself drift away from the Lord and the Lord say, well, you're so far over there I can't use you anymore. I'm going to have to cast you aside. 
You say, well, it sounds like they're losing their salvation. Well, in, in 1 Corinthians 3.10, he wrote this. Listen closely. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. You see what he's saying? The Apostle Paul is saying, <clears throat> this guy, he did some things in life and if it was gold, silver, and precious stones, when the blowtorch of Christ's eyes is applied to it, that won't burn up. But the wood, hay, and stubble, those things that were done apart from his will, those things that were done in the flesh, those things that were of no significance, he spent his time on wood, hay, and stubble. He said when the blowtorch hits that, whoosh, it's all gone. And there'll be no reward. You see, Christians won't lose their salvation because of how they live, but they can lose their rewards. And when we get to heaven, I'd, I'd rather have a big warehouse full of rewards when I get there than to just lose them all. And when we drift, we can lose them. What else can happen? Well, chastisement, we won't read it because of time, but in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, this same book, he talks about chastisement and that, that people that just drift too far and too long, finally God woos them back and the Holy Spirit says, come back to me, come back. And they just keep on drifting and going away. He says, finally the time comes when the chastisement will be applied. God's got a spanking spoon. Any of you ladies ever use a spoon on your children? <laughs> Don't worry, I won't turn you into social services. <laughs> uh, maybe a spatula. Maybe a little hickory switch. My grandma used to say, you kids get off of that porch and quit messing around or I'm going to get a switch off of that peach tree out there. <laughs> well, we knew what that meant. And God's got a hickory switch. Now he loves his children and he's not going to cast us off into hell, but he has a switch that will sting and hurt and burn. And when we drift and we just keep on drifting and we say no to the wooing of the Holy Spirit that tries to bring us back, when we say no, 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 then finally God has to apply the paddle. I heard, saw one of those memes on Facebook. You probably saw it where this guy said, you know, the worst thing about, about punishing children in Walmart for disobedience is I have no idea whose children they are. <laughs> uh, God knows his children. And he says if you're one of his children... In Hebrews chapter 12, he said, if you're one of his children, you can endure and will endure chastisement, get a spanking if you just keep on going and don't turn back. He said, if you, if you can just keep on going that way away from God, he says, you never were one of mine in the first place. That's what he says. I didn't make that up. God loves his children enough to spank them and get their intention. Well, let's... Let's look at the last point. Is there any help for those drifting further from the Lord and maybe they even feel helpless? I'm, I'm away from the Lord, but I want, to, I want to come back. I just don't know where to start and how to begin the remedy for drifting. Since it ha happens gradually, since it happens gradually, this drifting, since it happens gradually, we need to look around and get our moorings straight. Where were you this time last year? Were you doing more for God last year than you are now? Where were you five years ago? Were you doing more for God then than you are now? Did you love the Lord more in the past than you do now? Do you love His church more now than you did in the past? Do you want to share your faith with lost people more now or in the past? We need to look around and get our moorings and see where we really stand. That's the first thing to do. When I was in high school, we graduated in 1969, and we took our class trip to Pensacola, Florida. Uh, man, we, a bunch of teenagers just loved being on that beach, man. They, they, they were just having a good time. We, we would get out there every day and spend all day in the, in, on the beach. And, and 
ended up being, looking like a lobster from getting sun, sunburned. But boy, we were playing, having a good time. We bought some styrofoam surfboards. I don't know if they still sell them down there or not, but there on the beach, you could buy a styrofoam surfboard. It was probably six feet long, maybe seven. And it was made out of pretty thick styrofoam. And we, a bunch of us boys bought one of those each. And, and you could get on it, lay down on it and paddle out in the ocean, out away from the beach a good ways. And, and uh, none of us were good enough to stand up on it, <laughs> but we could lay on it and paddle around. And we were out, out from the beach a ways, afternoon, late afternoon, and we're playing, you know, splashing each other with water and hooting and hollering and just having a good time. We didn't notice it, but a storm was coming up from the other direction over the horizon. And boy, the dark clouds were rolling in. We didn't see them. We didn't know. We were just playing, splashing, and laughing, and hollering. And those storm clouds were coming in, and they began to they began to blow. And lightning began to flash, and thunder was sounding, and the waves were getting up. And we looked around and realized, hey, we better get out of this, you know. And we looked, and the shore was way over yonder. We had drifted so far. And here comes a tornado, and we're out there in the middle of the, out of the gulf. And by this time, the waves are getting big enough. They're splashing up over us, hitting us over. I mean, they're this tall or more, just knocking us off. Knocked me off my surfboard once or twice, and I was just, I can't believe I got grabbed a hold of the thing somehow and held on in that heavy wind and thunder and lightning. And now by this time, it's, we're just paddling like crazy, getting back to the beach, but we're not making any progress. In fact, we're going backwards. And one, one of our counselors that took us down there, uh, Arnold Harris, never forget. <laughs> Arnold, he's, he's a real nervous, anxious type anyway. And, and he saw what had happened, and we're going out to sea. <laughs> and he runs and calls the Coast Guard. And he tells the Coast Guard, hey, we got some students uh, on the class trip here, and they're on those little styrofoam surfboards, and they're going out to sea. <laughs> and the, the guy at the Coast Guard office said, yeah, we lose a bunch of them that way every year. <laughs> this guy just about pulled his hair out. The thunder, the lightning, the waves, that salt water hitting you in the face. And we're paddling like crazy trying to get back because we don't know where we're going to end up now. Drifting just keeps going further and further. Once you drift far enough, it's hard to get back, or at least in your mind. Well, after all that thunder and lightning, the storm passed over, and the current began to change. And how we had been fighting like crazy and not getting anywhere. Now we were coming back in towards the beach. I thought maybe we're going to make it. I never worked so hard in my life paddling. I mean, my arms were about to fall off. Paddling, paddling, paddling. And we were getting close enough, probably far as from here maybe to that church across the street there. We are about that close getting back into the beach. And one of the guys said, hey, I can touch the sand here. And I dropped off of my surfboard and put my feet down and the water came up to about here, but my toes were on sand, sandy bottom. And I could begin to tiptoe my way back to the beach and rest my arms. I don't know how long we'd been paddling in that shallow of water, but <laughs> we, we thought we were going to drown. Once you start to drift, you're in danger. And there are people that drown every year around beaches like that because of what they call rip, rip tides rip current, it can happen and just swoosh, take you right back out into open sea before you know what's happening and pull you under and drown you. What does the Bible say about getting back once we've drifted? Give heed in our text. In 1 Thessalonians, he says that we ought to remember about our first experience of salvation. If you're drifting and you you just don't feel, you're kind of numb about your Christianity. Remember what it was like when you first got saved. In 1 Thessalonians, he says, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. You remember how joyful it was when you first got saved? Man, you're glad. Your sins were forgiven. You're on your way to heaven now. You're not going to hell. And, uh, and people around you are glad you got saved. Do you remember that? That's one of the ways to get back from your drifting is look around, see where you are, and then begin to remember what it used to be like 
Romans 5.11 says, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Hey, I was a sinner and had no hope of heaven, and Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood so that my sins could be paid for. That's the atonement. He paid for my sins. He sacrificed himself, and he paid for yours. We ought to remember for drifting. Remember what he did for us. Whoa, we can't just turn back. We can't just keep drifting. Understanding that now we don't have to go to hell. Now we're on our way to heaven. Now we can serve God. That ought to help us get started back in the right direction. Remember the joy, the excitement that you once knew. And then repent. Repent means just turn around. You see, if you're drifting, you're going in the wrong direction, away from the Lord. When you repent, that means turn around, head back to the Lord. So when we realize where we are, how far we've come, what it used to be like in earlier times, then repent, say, I'm coming back to the Lord. One great problem with the start of a gradual drift is that it just picks up speed so quickly. And while we might think it's not important, it's these little things that we let slide, we can begin to lose our grip. Our ropes become muddy and we'll slip. What about church attendance? Is it as important to you as it used to be? Or is it something you can take it or leave it? What about sharing your faith with others? What about witnessing? Did you used to be on fire about telling other people about the Savior? What about walking with God and reading the Bible, prayer, devotion. What about leading your family in the way of God? Oh, that grandfather I told you about, these kids wanted him to come and see him get baptized. He did. and They went back to church a couple of times. And, and then he said to the preacher, after about the second or third time, he said, I need to talk to you. Um, the preacher said, you want to join the church, aren't you? He said, yeah. He said, I can read you like a book. I, need what you, I see the Lord working in your life. And so the preacher said, well, the first thing you need to do, you told me you got saved back there when you were a young man, the first thing you need to do is rededicate your life and start in the right direction and then join the church and start serving God like you should have been all along. And he told me with great joy yesterday as we visited. He said, I can't tell you how happy I am now that I'm serving the Lord. I'm going out on visitation. I'm helping share devotions with men's groups and stuff like that. I said, man, that's the way it ought to be. That's the way it's supposed to be. He said, I'm so glad. I said, man, your testimony has enriched my soul today. I'm glad to hear that. I've seen others that I visited yesterday, others that had drifted and drifted, and you can see the marks of sin on their lives, and they're still drifting. And I'm praying that God will somehow get their attention, give them more earnest heed, lest at any time we should let them slip. Decide now. If things are a little cold, decide now. I'm going to start winging my way back home. Decide now. To do what I said in that song we sang, the haven of rest. Let me read you the words again. The hymn says, My soul in sad exile was out on life's sea, so burdened with sin and distressed. Till I heard a sweet voice saying, make me your choice. And I entered the haven of rest. Jesus is the haven of rest. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us. Lord, as Christians, we know we can drift. We see it in the Bible time after time. And Lord, I don't think any of us want to drift. But Lord, that first step back, of winging our way back home can be the most difficult. I pray that you'd touch hearts right now and Lord, you'd say, take that first step. Turn right now. The way, we might, be, the way might be easier than you think. And Lord, we know that the way the father ran out to meet the prodigal son, that you would open your arms and welcome those back who have been drifting far away. Lord, I pray for those who have not been saved. I pray that Lord, you'd just Help them to understand that you are the haven of rest. There's no other way to heaven. There's no other religion. There's no other way of life. There's no other philosophy. Lord, help all of those who are lost and listening today to make that decision right now to enter the haven of rest.
to trust the Lord Jesus and what he did on Calvary's cross for their salvation. Lord, we pray that you'd bring these things to pass in their heart. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to ask